Hello, everyone. My guest today is Doug Buescher. He's a CEO of Leadspace, the leading customer data platform for B2B uh, folks. Leadspace was the ra- was rated as the leader in, for, by Forrester in 2019. It has over 200 customers, including leading B2B brands like Amex, Zoom, SAP, Salesforce, and Microsoft. Doug, you ready to take us to the top? Absolutely. All right. Customer data and just data products in general. It's a very fragmented space. How are you kind of carving out a niche here? Well, it's kind of interesting like I was at Salesforce, I was the CMO at Salesforce before this gig when everyone talked about engagement and now everyone is talking about data. The thing that matters is about AI and intelligence and how you figure out that data. And I think the new technologies are changing the way B2B companies and B2C companies can do that. Yep. Okay. So maybe describe, can you describe how one of your customers are using you today? Maybe Amex or, or someone you can talk about? Yeah, sorry. I, I, you broke up a little bit. So talk about Microsoft. They've talked a lot with us. Pretty much now, if you go onto a Microsoft site, you fill out a form or give them some information, we're helping them get information about who's the company, who you are, so they can get the right information back to you. They can We can use all the different data sets that we have, the models that they have, what they can actually figure out in terms of how to best personalize and send you information that's relevant to you. And that's a huge win, both for the customer, which is really important. So you don't get a lot of spam, you don't get a lot of rubbish and all that kind of stuff, but also for the company so that they can actually engage you with the right products and services so they can be more successful. So how help me understand how this is different from like a Discover Org or a, or a Clearbit or any of these other kind of tool providers or, or data providers? Sure. Well, the point about a customer data platform is more and more companies recognize you need lots and lots and lots of different data sets. So Discover is great. They're a partner of ours. But they are just one data set. Clearbit is just another data set. What you need to do is bring all these together at the person, the company, and also this new category called intent, and actually use that to sort of blend that data, create a single source of truth, a single identity, so that you can use that to build models and intelligence. So that's the difference between a data platform and just a data provider. And we work with all the big data providers, whether it's Discover, Zoom, DMB, all of those kinds of guys, Bombora. Uh, Just to be clear, you're, you're talking Zoom Info, not not Eric Juan Zoom. Sorry, yeah. Zoom, Zoom yeah. Info. Zoom is also a customer of ours as well. Yeah. So well, and Zoom Info is now Discover Org. You know, it's incredible they pulled that deal off. Now, now doing about 320 million bucks in ARR. Yeah, it's it's a great business, and I think you know with DMB also going private, right? You're going to see an interesting battle now between Discover and DMB as they sort of really look to consolidate the data space. You're talking Dun and Bradstreet, right? Indeed. Sorry. Yeah. Very good. All right. Uh, let's uh, give me a general sense here of, of, of kind of sizes. I'm sure you have customer cohorts that are all over the place, but on average, what would you say a customer is going to pay you per year to use your technology? Yeah, as you say, it is all over the place. And we bought ReachForce, which is a forms product. And so they have some pretty small customers, maybe five, 10, 15 K a year. Okay. But we also have customers which are in seven figures. So we sort of see the gamut, but typically we're working with enterprise software companies and they will typically spend six figures, something like that, because what they're trying to do is really kind of enable a sales team of thousands of people. So we'll call it $10,000 a month is maybe a sweet spot for you, something like that. Uh, another zero to that. Yes. No, no that was, <laughs> a month. That, that was a month, 10,000 a month. Oh, 10,000 a month. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and okay. So let's just stick with this kind of persona we've made up. So if I'm going to pay you about 10,000 a month or 120 grand a year, what kind of metrics are bounding that pricing plan? Do you upsell against any value metrics or how's that work? Uh, so we tend to follow pricing quite similar actually to, uh, uh, like a marketer or one of those guys, which tends to be on how big the data that we're working with is. So if you have a database of a million records, that might be that kind of price. It's it's fairly standard in this industry about pricing like that versus a seat-based model. And then, yeah, you know, we do data three real things, data management. So that's the core offering, which is to create that single source of truth. Then we help customers building various different models, lookalike models, predictive models, whatever. And we tend to, you know, potentially add incremental price for those models that help you get more information. And then we have activation points. If you activate into... Live ramp for ads or Salesforce or Marketo or you know your site, then we have those connectors and they tend to be one-off integrations that we do. Kind of like number number of API integrations essentially feeding the system. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, very good. Put this on a timeline for me. When did you launch? Uh, so the company is Israeli originally. So the founders out of you know the Israeli NSA was doing anti-terrorism kind of stuff. Amazing story. And that was back in 2010. And then we moved and I joined five years ago. That was when we moved the company really to be focused on the U.S. market. So five years building a great product in Israel. 
Now we still have R&D and so forth in Israel, but really the company's based here in San Francisco. In the you know Two months ago, we bought ReachForce, so that's also giving us a presence in Austin. And so that's really the scope of the company. Did, About did you people today. Did you come in with the battery B round eight? Was that part of what, were you like an EIR there after Salesforce or something? <laughs> no, I did. Battery were part of bringing me in. Um, I came in when we decided to move the focus of the business to the US. You know how these Israeli companies tend to be. There was a point at which the board said, are we just a technology play and we're going to sell to somebody as a piece of tech? Well, we are real business. And that's why I came in because I think there was enough momentum in the business for us to build a US office. But at that point though, Battery was already an investor in the company. They were actually one of the, I think the actual first investor originally in this company. In this and how much raised today total? Uh, we've raised today about 40 million total. Okay, 40. How, why is it different, uh, different than like the 56 million listed on Crunchbase? You know, Crunchbase is a approximate estimate that they take from lots of press releases and things in terms of how much we've raised in terms of capital. So it's it's reasonably close. Okay. Not a bad data source. As okay. we know data well, I mean, that's a pretty big data. difference, right? I mean, basically what you're saying is the 17, the, you know, the 17 million Series A in 2011, they're essentially not, that didn't really exist. You just have the 18 from Battery and the 21 from Arrowroot. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's some other capital raise in there in terms of things like debt as well, right? That all get kind of rolled up into the numbers that they report as you're in Crunchbase. Were you around when the company leveraged debt to drive growth or was that before your time? Uh, we had, when I joined, we had a little bit of debt. And as we continue to grow in terms of revenue, that's allowed us to get greater debt capacity. So we continue to grow on that front. Why have the fundraising been basically equal? So, I mean, this is, you know, the pattern you <laughs> typically see, right? Is like, okay, yeah. you do like a B and then a C is like triple the size and then it's triple size. You, it's basically been like a 17 to $20 million round, you know, since 2011, once every like three years. Why? Yeah. I mean, by the way, you could just be printing money and you just don't need more capital. I'm just curious why. Yeah, so a couple of things on that. It's a really good question, by the way. Um, so one thing is because we have a strong technology platform, we are not, you know, just selling ourselves to an investor on the basis of our revenue, right? We are selling ourselves on the fact that we have a really strong technology. So a lot of our investment goes into our R&D team in Israel, right? That's kind of the asset, one of the most important assets that we have. In that way, it's a fairly fixed amount that you're using to continue to build that skill. We have about the same R&D team that we've had over the last couple of years. And at the same time, our go-to-market, our sales and marketing has become more efficient. So what we've seen is we continue to invest in building the product, but we're really reasonably self-sustaining in the way that we actually grow the business. It's a little different from some of our erstwhile competitors in this space, which have spent a ton of money building a brand and throwing money at salespeople and doing all that kind of stuff but never really sorted out the underlying product. So that's why you see us being fairly fixed. And we're at a point where now, as you said, we don't actually need to raise any more money. And so that does become, as we look to potentially raise money in the future, if we were, it is to do things like buy other players in the space or do it inorganic or maybe you know, grow in a new market that we're not in like Europe. So you said, uh, did I hear you right? You said 100 folks on the team today? Yeah. And how many engineers? Uh, out of that, we're about 35 in the engineering. Okay. And it still, it sounds like based in Israel and how many quota carrying reps? Uh, we're, I wouldn't give these exact numbers, but we're sort of in double digits now. Okay. So call kind of more than 10. Yeah. Um, so the, the reason I asked that number is you said you're getting more efficient with with time, right? In terms of you don't need to throw more at marketing. I, I think that you would see this in the following number. Most CEOs I interview that have broken, you know, the 50 or $100 million AR mark, uh, they're driving their salesperson profitability up, right? So it maybe starts at like three or four X and then some are pushing seven, eight, nine, 10 X. So when you look at a salesperson who's fully ramped, right, at lead space uh, and you compare their total compensation, you know, when they hit OTE relative relative to the, the new booking, new ARR bookings target, the quota, is that like a, you know, is that really high for you? Seven, eight, nine X? Uh, I think in the kind of enterprise sales we do, we're not talking about seven, eight, nine X, right? I think the most of the metrics that I would see is if you pay a sales guy, you know, an OTE of 250, let's say, right? Then you might give them a quota of one to one and a half million bucks, right? Now, typically, we're seeing our sales guys exceed their quota, which is fantastic, right? But that benchmarks also to some of the metrics I've heard at Salesforce, where I was before, where 25% of your 
revenue is being spent on your sales costs, right? And so I think that's fairly consistent. I think if you're seeing 10x, you're probably being a little bit over optimistic, or you're in a very high velocity kind of sales model, a la Zoom, perhaps, right? Which are smaller accounts that are high frequency. Right? Well, but where I typically see this, though, is right? actually like indie, like like sales teams not built in the states, where salespeople are not actually there's not a ton of commission actually. Right. Which would require you to, and so that's fine, and it's a great business model, but that also tends to be an inside sales model. If we're trying to go out and sell a large deal to, I don't know, uh, Cisco or somebody. Typically, they would actually want somebody on the ground who they can work with because this is also about transforming the way they work. We're not just selling sort of a widget into their process. So they're good. Both of them are very good models. Um, they're just different go-to-market strategies. So to land a new $120,000 account, are you comfortable spending fully weighted the full hundred and twenty dollars for a 12-month payback? Or are you being more or less aggressive today? Sorry, I missed the start of that. Yeah, so pay, payback period on a $120,000 account. Are you happy with a 12-month payback period or more or less aggressive? Uh, 12 months, given our retention and upsell rate, would be fine. Okay. Um, are you generally, this is typically not a stationary number. CEOs are typically getting more or less aggressive depending on where the company is. Which way are you trending? So we are trending down in very interesting CAC questions here. So we're trending down in terms of our payback period right, to, you know, obviously goal is to get 12 months and less because then you're a self-funding company, right? I think at the same time, we will want to continue to get larger deals. So there's a balance for me. I don't, I actually feel quite happy with where we are with the payback period right now. There's, you know, other elements of the business that I want to continue to work on in terms of getting larger deals, more customers, and I'll stick with that payback in order to get to that outcome. Yeah. Okay. Back, bit of the backstory here. So 2010, you get going on, you join the company. Uh, sorry, that was when the company was founded. You said you joined four years ago or five years ago? Five years ago. Yeah. Five years ago. Okay. So you joined in call it 2014. Um, help me understand the, the customers that you were getting back then, are they the same customers today or have you really moved upstream? So uh, some of the customers are the same, like, you know, Oracle and Microsoft was a very early customer and others, right? Because they were fairly innovative. And some of them aren't, right? You know, some of them have changed. Typically, we've tended to lose the smaller customers, right? Because we have tended to go to doing more enterprise kinds of deals. And those customers who we started with, they might have bought $25,000 a year from us, and then they went to 100000 and now they're at 300000 So we've seen nice growth in terms of how we grow with them as we expand within those organizations. But, but we've been pretty lucky in terms of, or lucky or whatever, in terms of having customers that have been with us on this journey quite a long time, five, six years. So how many, I mean, how many customers are you serving today? Uh, we got uh, around just under 200 customers today. Okay. And it sounds like you've got a pretty impressive kind of expansion muscle, which is critical to any SaaS company, one to make up the churn <laughs> hole, right? And then I would consider, you know, world-class net revenue retention to be in the 130 to 140 range. So are you guys close to that? Have you beat that already? Or if not, when do you think, or what do you think you have to do to get there? Yeah, so we're definitely in the hundreds on the net revenue. I'm not going to share the exact numbers here. Um, continues to grow in the right direction, and I'm feeling pretty, pretty good at about it. Yeah, well, to, to get up to 100, obviously, you have to fill the gross churn number. So is that a big hole you're filling? Or are you talking like 10% revenue churn on a gross basis annually? Yeah, so we are, yeah, so we're fairly standard in those kinds of metrics that you would see in this industry. I think you've got a fairly good benchmark that you're sort of referring to. You're giving me way too much credit. So are you talking like 10%? Are you talking, you're you're very, Doug, you're very, you're very good at this, but I've done this too many times. I mean, so when you say standard though, I mean, I won't pin you down on your exact number, but 10% annually fair, you'd call that standard in the industry. Yeah, I think 10% churn is a pretty decent number in our industry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so second question, you're more than filling that hole to drive expansion revenue. Is mo is your strongest, I'm curious, you gave me some upsell metrics earlier in terms of API integrations, modeling, activation points. Yeah. Are there any one of these upsells that your sales team are just finding it's the most powerful one? It's the easiest upsell? The easiest upsell for us is getting into additional business units, right? If you think about, I don't know, um, we work with a company like, uh, well, I'll just go back to Microsoft because it's easiest. You know, we tended to work with, you know, 
one bit, right? Azure is where we would start. But then we get into the CDES and then we get into the whole global marketing organization. And then we get into Bing. You know, you grow within an organization by getting to broad, broader and broader sales teams. It's one of the beauties of being in enterprise software versus necessarily having to take the same customer and the same thing and sell them more. We do do that too. So, you know, success breeds success, right? I, I strongly believe that enterprise sales is a lot about finding somebody who's an advocate. You know, you can do all of this outreach and all this SDR stuff. But number one is when somebody goes to somebody else and says, what should I use to solve my data management problem? And they say, you should talk to LeadSpace. And when that happens within somebody within your own company and you've already been through all of their complicated technology integration problems, it's a really good place to be. So I think that's why we see the success. Before we wrap up with the famous five, and I can tell you're going to hate, <laughs> you're going to hate, you're going to hate me for what I'm about to do, but I have to do okay. it. Uh, you say 200 customers, ARPU called a hundred thousand, 120,000 bucks. I mean, that would put your MRR today at somewhere around $2 million per month or a $24 million run rate. Is that generally correct? Uh, we inherited a few customers from ReachForce who are smaller, as I mentioned earlier on. So it's a tad less than that. But that's when will you break it, going. do you think? You, will you, is that a stretch goal to break it this year? Or you think you need next year to break 24 in ARR? Uh, we will be there, I would expect, early next year. Okay, fair enough. And then help me understand historical growth. So where were you a year ago? Uh, we've been pretty consistent at growth. I don't know if I'm going to give you all these metrics. <laughs> well, I mean, I can guess, right? I mean, you, you fit base. I mean, everything you've given me is pretty basic and standard, not basic, but standard, right? So, I mean, I would assume based yeah. on what you raised and what you're doing, you're growing probably about, you know, 80 to 110% year over year. And you're going to keep doing that for a year or two before you go down to like a, you know, a, you know, a 30 or 40% growth rate year over year. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 that's it, the, what's what we're required to do in terms of seeing nice growth, some of the numbers, right? getting to a good scale, right? As you said, in sales and marketing business, there's very, very few scale players, very few people who are doing 20, 25 in enterprise software and the kinds of things. And most importantly, doing that off the back of a technology platform that as, you know, we talked about at the start, CDPs are being, you know, aggressively looked at by all the big technology. CDP is a customer data platform? Customer data platforms. Yeah. Okay, very good. And, and just last question on expansion over the past. So if you recall 100% year over year, did most of that come from driving, because I just, I think you just did this acquisition. Did most of that expansion come from expanding lower paying customers or adding new logos altogether? Uh, most of it comes, we actually have a land and expand strategy. So what we'll tend to do is we'll go into a customer, we'll start working with them in a limited way, and then we'll grow that way. So some of it comes from new logos, but less than, you know, I'm not making all that from that, but most of it comes from our ability to take a, a POC or a relatively small piece of business and really, you know, triple or 5x the time as uh, the size as people actually start using the product. Yeah. And so you, that's where we're seeing it. Are you planning to get back to break even before you go out and do your next round if you do choose to do next round? Yes. Okay. Do, do you think you will raise more capital or no? I think this space is ripe for consolidation. I think if we raise more capital, it's so we can actually go and acquire more businesses. Why wouldn't you just use non-dilutive debt for that? Why wouldn't I use debt for that? Yeah. I mean, to, th this is like a play that Vista and all the big guys would use when they're buying SaaS companies. There's a lot of it. They, you know, it's a kind of buying a house. You put up 10% equity, you know, 90% debt. Yeah. So my, so the balance between equity versus debt is a good question, right? I haven't, I guess when I think of it, I think of raising more capital than necessarily the vehicle for that. Capital, <laughs> fair, enough. fair enough. If you were going to raise <laughs> in the next year, what would, what amount would you target? You think you're talking like 20, 30 million ish. I, I think if we did a growth round, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. All right. Very good. Let's wrap up with the famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? Oh, my favorite business book. Uh, I think behind the cloud is pretty good, actually. <laughs> no, no bias there at all. No, but you know, I didn't. I don't in general <laughs> buy business books. I think you know, I was at McKinsey for many years, and so I don't buy. It. But that was pretty good as a marketeer to read how you know he did his work. Yeah, the Benioff book has a great story there. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying? Uh, you know, I work for Josh Silverman um, when I was at Skype, uh, who's now over at Etsy, and I follow his progress i think he's a brilliant analytical marketing consumer ceo so great guy number are, are you trying to close him right now on a deal is that why you're giving him <laughs> no he's a consumer product we don't sell to be consumer. all right just check gotta ask <laughs> number three what's your favorite online tool for building your company uh slack 
I, you know, I've been for a long time in, uh, you know, this collaboration space when I was at Skype and MiG-33 and various places. So I love online collaboration. Slack's the first one to have got it right. And when we're building a team in Israel and here and whatever, transforms it. Love how, it. Doug, how many hours yeah. of sleep do you get every night? Uh, I'm pretty good. I get eight hours a night. Okay. And how old are you? I'm an old man. No. <laughs> how old are you? How old am I? 51. 51. Last question. And what's your situation? Married, single kids? I'm married with one 14 year old kid. Oh, good. I'm getting your hands full here. Last question. What do you wish your 20 year old self knew? Uh, oh my God. What? Um, so it's interesting. I wish that I had had more exposure to all the different, all the different kinds of things you can do as a person. I was very, you know, I went to Oxford. I came from a family. My grandfather started a company. I was very much in a certain box of doing something and wanting to be a CEO. As I look at my son, I'm like, I hope he expands his horizons and just thinks about all the opportunities before he jumps into one. Guys, Lead Space, a customer data platform for B2B folks, 200 customers today doing call at 1.7, 1.8 ish per month with eyes on a $24 million run right here shortly in the next call at one or two quarters. Uh, raised about $40 million to date to grow the business to where it is today. About 100 folks on the team, 35 engineers call it north of 10 in terms of quota carrying reps where they optimize for call it 5x profitability. Spending about a 12, uh, 12 months worth of lifetime value on CAC right now. So 12 month payback period with north of 100% in terms of net revenue retention as Doug looks to scale the business. Doug, Thanks for taking us to the top. Great. Thanks a lot.